wake up. It's the Sleep Unplugged podcast, episode 92, Sleep and Nicotine. I'd have another cigarette, but I can't sleep. Hello, everyone. This is Chris Winter. Welcome to the Sleep Unplugged podcast. I'm excited for you to be here. If you're new to the Sleep Unplugged podcast family, welcome. If you're a veteran, welcome back. It's been a busy week. I am finally finished with spring training. I appreciate all the comments and well wishes. I was posting some videos from my spring training trips. I just I finished Arizona first, and then I had a big tour of some Florida teams and really fun to see those guys and, and talk to the, the, the Blue Jays and the, and the Red Sox and um, really enjoyed the time spent with them. And it's good to be done. It's good to be home. It's good to be back. I to get to see a, a Orioles Blue Jays game uh, yesterday, and it was really nice just to relax. The work was done, have some peanuts, enjoy a beautiful day in Sarasota watching some some baseball. So, during my talks with baseball players, it was interesting. I, you know, I've done this for a long time, and we talk about a lot of different topics. One of the players asked me, hey, you know, what does nicotine do to sleep? And smoking isn't a really big thing in smoking, at least smoking cigarettes is not a really big thing in Major League Baseball. But with the rise of sort of nicotine pouches, Zen, that's big time right now. So nicotine has kind of created its own resurgence here. And so while it wasn't really a topic of big conversation in the past, it's sort of risen to be. And, and so I thought that would be a great topic uh, for today's show. So if you've got a great topic for today's show, and a bunch of you have written in and given me some great ideas, and I promise you every idea goes into a little database I have. And one concern I had about this podcast when I started was, well, we'll talk about alcohol and then we'll talk about bad dreams. And then we'll talk about CPAP machines and a couple more, and then we'll be done. I love sleep, think it's an endless source of fascination, but I am incredibly excited about all the ideas I have lined up, ready to go, and there's still more to come. We've got some really good ones lined up in the next few weeks. So if you'd like to get in touch with the show, give me your ideas for a great topic, want to know something about sleep. You can DM me at Dr. Chris Winter. That's Instagram, Dr. Chris Winter TikTok. We have a YouTube Sleep Unplugged page, Sleep Unplugged page, where we put all the videos of our content on there. You can find it. I've got two books: The Sleep Solution: Why Your Sleep Is Broken and How to Fix It, as well as The Rested Child: Why Your Tired, Wired, or Irritable Child May Have a Sleep Disorder and How to Help. Excited about the podcast. We're continuing to do well. We continue to be one of the top medical podcasts in the United States. We were top 10 in Poland this week. And I believe there's actually a Polish edition of my book, The Sleep Solution. So for all of the listeners in Poland, if you would like to copy of my book in your native tongue, it is available. So before we get in, we always talk comments, corrections, criticisms. I got a couple of good ones. There was an email a couple of episodes back I mentioned during the podcast that at the Naval Academy, the first years were called plebes, the second years were called youngsters, the third years didn't really have a name in, the, 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 in, your, in your final year at the Naval Academy, you're a firstie. And my son, uh, Tyson, a lot of his buddies, Brendan, uh, Jared, uh, Tony, uh, Matt, all those guys are getting ready to, to graduate from the Naval Academy. I said, I didn't really know what the names for the West Point people were because I'm not really involved in that situation. And somebody from the West Point, somebody from the West Point. It's like when I grew up, it was always called the Walmart. Going on down to the wall, it was actually the Walmarts, but the Walmart. And we'll hang out after the football game. So um, somebody from West Point wrote in and said, Hey, I listen to your podcast. I just thought I would answer your question that at West Point, the freshmen are called plebes, like at the Naval Academy. Sophomores were called yearlings, I guess, because of the whole goat thing at the Naval Academy or at West Point. 
Uh, juniors were referred to as cows after the phrase, when the cows come home. Since the in the early days of West Point, that was the first time cadets were allowed to go home. And seniors or first classmen were called firsties. And at the Naval Academy, anybody, I'm sorry, at, at West Point, anybody at the Naval Academy is referred to as a squid. And the other thing that I think is hilarious, and that was from Chris here. Thank you for writing in, Chris. I really appreciate it. One of my favorite traditions at these academies are when you graduate, the bottom individual of the class, academically ranked at the Naval Academy, is called the anchor or the anchorman, uh, probably the anchor now. And at West Point, the bottom person is called the goat. And the tradition, I think, at West Point was even if you're the, the last person academically at West Point, you're still better than anybody at the Naval Academy, which is why they called you the GOAT. Um, so I think that's fantastic. And then if you watch the ceremony, which I'm really excited to go to in May and, and see my son graduate, apparently everybody cheers for the anchorman or the anchor. And when you go up, I guess, to get your commissioning, or I don't really know what you, you get. I don't think it's a diploma, but you get something. As you pass the anchor, you hand that individual $10. So at the end of the, you know, the person's got a whole bunch of money, but I think my son said we just Venmo them now. So it's not as ceremonial as it used to be. So thank you, Chris, for writing in. Um, the other comment um, that I wanted to, 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 to relate was from, I want to make sure I pronounce her name correctly here. It's Jeunesse, which rhymes with finesse, um, and Kate's, uh, uh, Jeunesse Kate's wrote in and said, Hey, I wanted to give you some feedback on episode 85. And episode 85 was insomnia and fear, so scared to sleep. And she wrote a very thoughtful uh, email and said, listen to your podcast. I probably should have written in and said some positive things, but alas, um, I have uh, something negative that I want to say. And she said, I really was shocked by your episode 85 and felt like this was a real missed opportunity on explaining how CBTI actually does treat the unwanted fear and theoretical underpinnings um, of insomnia via fear treatment, anxiety and fear and fear avoidance are a vicious cycle. And the way we over overcome these unwanted fears is repeated exposure to the feared stimulus without negative outcomes. I know you're not a psychologist, but I wish you would have acknowledged this would have been helpful. Also, CBTI does address this. It's one of the reasons why sleep restriction works. It is the exposure as opposed to the avoidance of the unusual, the usual fear of not sleeping to learn that, that with less sleep, that people will survive. And, and, and so basically she just goes on to say, I really think that your episode painted CBTI in sort of a negative way. And I really wish you hadn't done that because for people like Jeunesse who are trained in CBTI and who really are practitioners of it, that this is the way that we get through um, and, and solve um, insomnia. And I, I really appreciated Jeunesse writing in because if, if you all know the way this podcast works is I get a thought or an idea and look into it a little bit, I sit down and record it once and I'm done. And generally the next day, it releases Sunday night at midnight, or I guess technically Monday morning at midnight. And usually on Monday when I run my dogs in the evening, I'll take a listen to it and see if there's any mistakes that were made, et cetera. And when I listened to it, I was like, you know, it, I'm not sure I got across what I wanted to say. So Janessa, I appreciate you writing and I agree with what you're saying. My point was for a lot of individuals who are not CBI trained like you are. She's a clinical psychologist. She knows what she's talking about. For a lot of people uh, or dabble in it, um, providers or even the media, it starts, what I was trying to say was that some tenets of CBTI, like if you get in bed and you can't fall asleep within five to 15 minutes, you must get out of bed because we don't want to create that association of fear, dread, anxiety of trying to sleep with being in bed. But my point is, if somebody said, I don't mind being in bed, can I just stay there? Sure, you can. So what I was trying to say in that episode, and it was not done particularly well, was that we don't want to substitute new fears for the old fears. Like, I'm scared of disappointing somebody by getting staying in bed too long. 
uh, when I should be getting out of bed. So now not only do I fear not sleeping, but I fear that if I'm not getting out of bed within 15 minutes, that that's bad too. And I think that in a situation where you're dealing with a trained, certified CB, CBTI provider, this isn't going to happen. If you're dealing with Janess and you can follow Janess, I found her on Twitter and following her and she, I'm sure she's giving great information about sleep. You know, if, you follow, if you're dealing with somebody like her, she's not going to fall into these traps. She's trained to help you understand the obstacles to your own sleep. So I really appreciate writing in Janess and, and I think that that we'll, we'll, we'll address CBTI again in future episodes and, and we'll, we'll correct some of the wrongs we made in that episode. Uh, for our title, I, I did change it a little bit. It's I'd have another cigarette, but I can't sleep in the title of this podcast. The actual line from the song in Paradise City by Guns N' Roses is I'd have another cigarette, but I can't see. Uh, so this was from Guns N' Roses' 1987 debut, Appetite for Destruction, seventh biggest selling album of all time. It is the biggest debut album ever out there. It was really interesting when it was originally released. It didn't do particularly well, but sort of got some lucky breaks along the way. And MTV agreed to play it three times or something like that. And it was just wildly uh, requested. And suddenly the, the album exploded. And it's up there with like Hotel of California, uh, Led Zeppelin 4, Rumors. I mean, this is a big, big album. And uh, Guns N' Roses formed by Tracy Guns and Bill Rose uh, from Indiana. These two guys came together and that's where the Guns and Roses came. Tracy Guns also uh, was a founding member of LA Guns, but he le left almost immediately, but they kept the name Guns and Roses. Bill Rose changed his name to Axl Rose and the rest is history. Uh, it's interesting when you listen to Paradise City, some people think it was kind of stolen from a song uh, by Hanoi Rocks called Lost in the City. So I invite, I'll, I'll put on Paradise City and Lost in the City on the Spotify playlist, and you can be the judge if uh, the boys from Guns N' Roses lifted that song and just sped it up a little, or slowed it down a little bit. But uh, Hanoi Rocks, very influential group in the hard rock and, and metal scene, and, and Guns N' Roses are on record of saying they were very influential to them too. So Paradise City, amazing song. We'll put it on the Spotify playlist. So let's talk about nicotine. Uh, it's probably due that we've talked about that. Uh, there's a lot of nicotine out there and with different methods of getting nicotine, cigarettes, um, pipes and cigars, which have been around forever. But now we also have little packages like Zen packages. We have vaping. So nicotine delivery systems are all over the place. And you know, we're talking about West Point. We're talking about the Naval Academy. You know, these things are very, very common in colleges. When I was talking to uh, one of the guys from one of the baseball teams I work with, I uh, had a little circular bulge in one of his pockets. And I said, that wouldn't happen to be Zen in your pocket, would it? And he said, I'm not telling you if it's one way or the other, if it's Zen or not. And so we had a discussion about theoretically, if it were Zen, do you think it affects your sleep? And so caffeine, we talk about a lot. We've talked about alcohol and it's only fitting that we talk about uh, nicotine. So what does nicotine do? Are there any positives to nicotine? And I found a 91 study because I remember thinking, I remember back to some of the research that was being done when I was in high school and college. I remember looking this up and there were some thoughts that, you know, there might be some positives to nicotine, not necessarily, you know, the carcinogenic burning of certain chemicals, but nicotine itself and in this 1991 study, they said, yeah, maybe there's some positives when it comes to reduction of body weight, which we definitely see. As a provider, I often feel very conflicted about smoking. And I ask all my patients about smoking because A, I want to know if they smoke so we can talk about that and the health-related risks surrounding it. But B, as a sleep spe specialist, I'm always interested when somebody smokes, asking them why they smoke. And it's a fascinating question. You can, even if you're not a doctor, next time you talk to somebody who smokes, say, why do you smoke? Oh, I love the taste. Or I only do it when I go out drinking. I've got this urge to do it. Or in some cases, they might tell you, I do it to stay awake, which to me is really interesting. So when you using it to, uh, when you're smoking, a lot of individuals, when they stop, they start to gain weight. So, you know, I see a patient once every six months, once a year for my sleep apnea patients, and they come back in 
and they've clearly gained a lot of weight. And you're like, hey, you know what's going on? Have you been in the last year? Oh, I'm doing really well. I'm so excited. Quit smoking. And my first thought is, wow, I wonder which is the, this would be a great study if it's not done. I looked for it. I couldn't find it. What, what, what predicts longevity? What predicts, predicts health better? When an individual stops smoking, the lowered risk of, you know, pulmonary, lung cancer, the higher risk of the sequela of weight gain. I'm hopeful that it's the, you're better off without the cigarettes, but you know, for some people who gain a lot of weight, I, I do wonder sometimes. So a reduction of body weight, uh, enhancement of performance, which if you talk to people in college, they would tell you, hey, look, I've got, you know, I'm taking 18 credit hours. I'm also on the lacrosse team. And man, I just cannot get it done if I don't have Zen. And I know it's a big thing at the military academies. I mean, I know it's a big thing in a lot of places. So that performance enhancement might be a positive reason for using these, these drugs. Uh, there was uh, evidence in the past. I don't know if it's been debunked. I didn't have a chance to really look into it. You know, there's thoughts that maybe that cigarette nicotine is protective of things like Parkinson's disease, Tourette's, and even Alzheimer's disease. Sometimes you see lower incidence of those disorders in individuals who smoke. Uh, ulcerative colitis, there was a lot of uh, communication about that, I remember about 10 years ago. And then sleep apnea. And there were some studies showing that perhaps individuals who smoke were at lower risk for having sleep apnea. It does make me wonder if some of that might be related to weight. Stop smoking, individuals gain weight, and the weight gain does make you more susceptible to sleep apnea. So let's focus first on sleep, because that's really what the podcast is about. If you're using nicotine, what are you doing to sleep? And there was a 2009 study out of Germany that basically said, look, if you're a nicotine user, you are setting yourself up for a higher risk of insomnia. Individuals who are struggling to fall asleep when they've decided that they want to. There is an increased sleep latency. So kind of like caffeine, if you're smoking, you're using a stimulant when you've decided to turn the lights out and go to bed, you are more likely to have a longer period of time between lights out and when you actually fall asleep. Sleep fragmentation, you're more likely to awaken a lot during the night and decreased slow wave sleep with reduced sleep efficiency. So if you're having more fragmentation in the night, you're most likely gonna have reduced sleep efficiency and sleep efficiency being defined as the amount of time you spend in bed, compared to the amount of time that you're sleeping. So we generally think about 85% as being normal. If it's much higher than that, it makes you wonder why are you so efficient? Why are you falling asleep so quickly and staying asleep so well? If you're very inefficient, that would be a reduced sleep efficiency. Uh, more increased daytime sleepiness, which seems to follow if you're destroying or disrupting sleep quality, you're gonna have more problems with sleep, um, daytime sleepiness um, when you're using nicotine. Nicotine also seems to create a fairly significant suppression of rapid eye movement sleep or REM sleep. So when you think about alcohol, that's a big factor with alcohol use that the alcohol tends to suppress REM sleep. And remember when we talked about it's metabolized, it comes rushing back in the second half of the night in an unusual way. It seems like nicotine might do that same thing. Depressive symptoms and sleep impairment during nicotine withdrawal also seems to have a negative impact on individuals. So it's not only just the individual who is on nicotine, but there can be sleep disruption that is actually associated with the discontinuation of the nicotine. And as you can imagine, if you're a smoker, you're going to have an increased incidence of respiratory disorders, which is going to further worsen sleep quality and further worse and difficulty with daytime symptoms. So uh, there was actually, so, you know, in looking at all this, you know, those are the sort of the, the, the fundamental ways that nicotine might be affecting sleep negatively. There was a 2019 study in the Journal of Addiction, Addiction Medicine. It was titled Impact of Nicotine and Other Stimulants on Sleep in Young Adults. And they were looking at different chemicals and how they affected sleep. And I'm going to read a line from the conclusion of the study, which was that these chemicals that were studied in, the, in this paper negatively affect sleep. But nicotine is particularly deleterious to sleep quality, which I thought was really interesting. Because if you look at that, like that study, 
there were a lot of pretty heavy duty stimulants and, and, and chemicals that were being studied. And they're kind of singling out nicotine as saying, look, all these things are bad, but nicotine seems to be particularly bad. There was a 2019 study called Sleep Quality in Cigarette Smokers Associations with Smoking-Related Outcomes and Exercise. And so compared to the general population, cigarette smokers report that their sleep quality is generally poorer than non-smokers. And what's interesting is poor sleep quality in cigarette smokers is typically associated with greater dependence and greater use of nicotine. And, and that's sort of reflected in a 2020 study that was titled Sleep Disturbances and Nicotine Addiction, a Bidirectional Relationship. So one of the eye-opening things to me about nicotine is that not only is nicotine making your sleep bad, it's particularly deleterious to your sleep. But now we get into the vicious cycle of with your sleep being bad, you are now more likely to depend upon the nicotine. It's going to be harder for you to stop it because now the poor sleep is leaving you feeling a certain way and your brain's response is, well, I guess I need more nicotine to fix this problem. So really interesting to think about that in terms of an individual who might say, hey, look, why don't you stop using the Zen? Oh, I'd love to, but man, I am so, you know, struggling so much to get through the day. I need the Zen to make it from point A to point B. Maybe, but maybe if the Zen were stopped, the quality of your sleep would get better so that you could get through your day the next day more effect effectively without it. And for a lot of people who've been on that for so long, they don't remember what it was like to go through a day without the little white pack between your lip and teeth, right? So it becomes kind of a vicious cycle and a self-fulfilling prophecy, which you don't really see with things like alcohol, maybe with caffeine, but I, you know, I, I don't necessarily, I mean, I think caffeine makes sleep quality poor if you're drinking all through the day leading up to the night. I'm, you know, maybe I've never seen any research about, it. I'm sure poor quality sleep might lead to more caffeine use, but I think with nicotine, it's a little bit more of a thing in terms of the duration of people using it. I don't meet a lot of people who voluntarily cut their nicotine off at lunchtime. A lot of caffeine users do, myself included. I really don't like to drink it. I love to drink it after you know lunchtime. I just know it really affects my sleep negatively. So I think thinking about that bi-directional relationship is really important. So does dose matter? Does it matter how many cigarettes, how many Zen packages? And the answer is yes. It was a 2021 study that was entitled Assessing the Effect of Nicotine Dose in Cigarette Smoking on Sleep Quality. And so those 360 patients were in, included in the study. Average age was about 42 years old. They were divided into three groups, a 0.4 milligram, a 5.2 milligram, and a 15.8 milligram, I like small, medium, and extra, extra, extra large. You know, that's the, that third group was the group that, remember you get punished, you know, you got caught smoking. So I, I never smoked, I've never smoked a cigarette in my life. I have sort of a phobia about them. Like just the idea that paper cigarette thing touching my lips kind of makes me feel sick to my stomach. So, but I remember, you know, your friends would get caught smoking a cigarette and the punishment back in the day was to make the child smoke the entire pack. And of course, you'd get sick and you'd never want to smoke them again, I guess is what was supposed to happen. Um, I'm not sure how effective that treatment is. I didn't see any studies for the effectiveness of the smoke the whole pack method of child raising and sick, uh, nicotine aversion therapy. Uh, maybe Jeunesse can tell us about that because uh, she's a clinical psychologist and she would know about what do you do to create a healthy relationship with something rather than using a fear-based approach, which I would imagine smoke the whole pack of Marlboro Reds would be. So anyway, so in, anyway, the, in this study, they're actually looking at the dose and among the high nicotine dose group, 
the number of participants who had worsened sleep was significantly higher. So I think it's pretty safe to say that the more cigarettes, the more Zen, the more nicotine, the worse your sleep's going to be like it is for most other chemicals that we ingest in our body. So I'm going to close this episode with an interesting study that I found in 2019 about nicotine and memory. So when we go back to the 1991 study about does nicotine have positive effects. One of them was on, you know, enhancement of performance. And memory is something that's always been sort of loosely associated with nicotine uh, in sort of memory enhancement. And so in this study, they're basically saying, look, we see a relationship between sleep spindle activity and memory enhancement. And so this was a um, study, it was entitled Nicotine Increases Sleep Spindle Activity. So sleep spindles are these little EEG signatures that you see in light sleep. So if you're reading a sleep study, you see all these little waves going up and down, your brain wave patterns, they're EEGs, we see eye movements, we see muscle activity. So as we're looking at an individual who's awake, we see that EEG start to change, the speed of it change, the frequency of the up and down change. And suddenly we're, hey, you know, this this has changed so much that this individual has gone from awake to now being asleep. And we often call that in one sleep. That's the first stages of sleep that you see. And it's pretty transient because soon after a person enters into in one sleep, we start to see the emergence of one of two things or both. One are called K-complexes. And you can look up K-complex in a Google image search and see what it looks like or in Wikipedia. And the other is a sleep spindle. And so when you see a lot of spindle activity, that has been associated with enhanced memory activity. So in this study, they're basically saying, look, does nicotine increase spindle activity? And in this study, it basically said it was a single blind randomized study uh, looking at 10 healthy participants who were recorded for two nights. One night they recorded with a sham patch. The second night, they recorded with a nicotine patch. So one night, they've got enhanced nicotine activity. The other night, they don't. And they're looking at differences in sleep spindle duration, amplitude, number, frequency, density. And they found that under the nicotine condition, so when you're wearing the nicotine patch, spindles were more numerous. And so the thought was, in the future, we should look at whether or not using nicotine patches which seem to increase spindle activity, how they're actually influencing memory, could it be actually enhancing memory? So if you are a smoker, if you are a Zen user, if you are a nicotine user, my hope is that you're going to hear this podcast and the nicotine is going to help you remember that nicotine is not great for your sleep. So that's it. Uh, this is the Sleep Unplugged podcast. My name is Chris Winter. You can Text me, DM me at uh, Dr. Chris Winter via Instagram, Dr. Chris Winter TikTok, Dr. Chris Winter Twitter. You can buy the book Sleep Unplugged. I'm sorry, Sleep Solution, as well as the rest of Child. Follow our Sleep Unplugged YouTube page. You can subscribe, or I don't know what you do, like our Spotify Sleep Unplugged Volume Two playlist. Where we'll be adding. Paradise City by Guns N' Roses and all the songs we talk about on the podcast are on the Spotify playlist. And like, subscribe to this podcast. We really appreciate that. And if you have a few seconds to leave a review of the podcast, we appreciate that as well too. So that's it. This episode is done and dusted. I'm going to leave you with my favorite cigarette musical lyric which i chose not to do because i think we've done an oasis song before but i'm a huge fan of the song cigarettes and alcohol i think it was off their debut album is it my imagination or have i suddenly have i if i finally found something worth living for i was looking for some action but all i found were cigarettes and alcohol which are not good for sleep until next week sleep well <laughs>